I think we're live now. Just going to check that I'm muted on the public YouTube page because that has been a problem before. Yeah, we're here. I think we're, we're here. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, the National Creative Writing Industry Day um, in partnership with Manchester Writing School. This is our second free conference of the week. No, second free panel at the conference in the week. Um, so it's author, uh, marketing and online branding. Um, so I'm joined by four professionals um, who are going to kind of give you some tips on how to um, push yourself online as an author, how to put yourself out there, how to harness um, all the socials uh, that are available to us at the moment. So um, I have with me uh, Naomi Bacon, who's the director at Tandem Collective, which is a marketing and PR company that specializes in books. Um, I'm also joined by Hamza Jahanzab, who's a marketing executive at Icon Books, Kat McKenna, who's a marketing and brand consultant, uh, and this panel is chaired by poet Andrew McMillan, who's the author of Physical and Playtime, and he's a member of Manchester Writing School. Um, I'm going to disappear into the background now and let these guys um, share their expertise, but I'll pop back up at quarter to 12 and we'll have a Q&A. So as usual, if you have any questions for any of the panellists during the talk, please put them in the YouTube chat and I'll be able to read them out um, towards the end. So I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us this morning for this panel on author marketing, online presence, um, online branding. As was said, I'm a senior lecturer in the Manchester Writing School at Manchester Met. I teach poetry mainly there and so um, it's really great to be working in tandem with Common Press um, and to be bringing this conference to you all and particularly this panel which I'm really excited about and just to run down that panel again of, of distinguished guests we've got Naomi Bacon the director of Tandem Collective we've got Ham Hamza Jahanzeb marketing executive at Icon Books and we've got Kat McKenna a freelancer in marketing and a brand consultant and also on my knee we've got Patricia the Pug so if there's any odd <laughs> noises any kind of snoring any strange sounds it's not me, it's the dog. And I have to say that as a disclaimer um, before we get started. So as was said, you guys will have a lot of questions, I think, to ask of this panel. I've got some things that I want to chat about. But I first of all just want, it's quite a mysterious, I think, a broad topic in that sense. Author marketing, online presence, branding. They're quite maybe, for some of us that are new to it, nebulous concepts. And so I want to give each panellist just a chance to say what they're specific role is or what their specific kind of space is within that world um and i'll just go down alphabetically by second name i think so naomi um can we start off with you please of course yes yeah. so my background so i i actually know cats already from we were at pam at millen together and um, so i was at pam mac for about six years and then four years ago i decided to leave and set up my own marketing agency and we were, for the, in the beginning, very much a one-stop shop. Um, one client said we were a one-stop shop for getting shit done, which I loved. Um, <laughs> but we very much, we did everything. Um, I said yes to everything. Um, and then two years ago, we did a, an experimental campaign whereby we did a real-time read-along for uh, a book called Fierce. It was set over four hours. Uh, it was shoestring budget. Um, there was no, no money to pay big-name influencers. Um, and we needed sort of uh, lots of lovely visuals. It was very much kind of author care. Um, and we were just overwhelmed by the kind of plethora of content that came out of it. Uh, the engagement was, was incredible. We had 20, I think 20 micro influencers involved. Um, and from that point, we've kind of spent the past two years finessing that model. And now it is all we do. So all, all Tandem does now is run Instagram read-alongs. So Instagram is kind of, kind of what I'm going to be focusing on today and how to build community uh, and micro-influencer activity. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Naomi. Um, Hamza, can we come to you next? And again, just the same, just setting out the lay of the land for you. Yeah, so I'm currently uh, the marketing executive at Icon Books, who are a publisher of non-fiction intelligent books, including the Graphic Guide series, which I'm sure all of you must have picked up at university <laughs> They were such an informative uh, part of my university years. Um, but basically, my role involves everything from, you know, a writer being signed up 
from an acquisitions meeting, I drew up marketing plans, which includes digital, so anything pertaining to newsletters that I'll send out from Icon Books about our latest releases and our lead titles for the year ahead. Uh, but I also work on partnerships um, just this year. Uh, as soon as I arrived at the company, I set up a, co a competition for a, a B giveaway. Uh, Hamza, you're on mute. I'm sorry, you muted yourself there halfway um, through, Hamza. It wasn't me. Yeah, um, sorry about that. Um, I just oh. wanted to just, um, yeah, just say that um, I worked on um, a campaign earlier this year for a book called Liquid Gold about how Roger Morgan Grenville um, found his love for beekeeping um, after having a chat with a pub uh, in the pub. Um, and I ran a giveaway. So part of my um, sort of role is to ensure that the marketing of a book, um, i.e. the social assets are created, the Amazon page is looking up dispatch, mm -hmm. anything pertaining to online adverts, uh, the A plus page, um, when you see from the publisher on Amazon it is, you know, as, as um, sort of visually aesthetically pleasing as possible. So that's part of what I do, you know, I'm, I'm um, the person who's in charge of everything, uh, at, you know, marketing a book. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Hamza. Um, and Kat, if we just come to you again, just kind of your role and, and how, how you operate within this world. Yeah, how do I operate within this world? Um, so I have been in publishing for just over 12 years. Oh, the drilling has started next door just in time for me to start talking. That's perfect. Um, I worked in publishing for just over 12 years, most recently, as Amy said, at Pam McMillan, where I was the head of marketing um, for children's books. So my role is very specialised in children's um, and teen, which has been my passion since I really started in the industry. Um, I went freelance um, in May. So brilliant timing for me there. Um, but what I really wanted to do and be able to focus on more, I think, is I've got a real passion for brand development. And I, you know, I started in publishing, you know, all those years ago thinking that what I loved was was literary books and kind of, you know, helping. And I do love that and launching debuts, but I really love looking into the bigger world of how can we kind of develop a brand? How can we make this kind of bigger and how, you know, not just like that pub date moment, but how can we kind of think in the long term? So at the moment, I'm doing that with some really exciting brands, including World Book Day, um, who I'm going to fly the flag for a bit today because I'm really enjoying working on that. Um, but yeah, so that's where I'm coming from, brand and also digital, just like the, the other guys. I think it's become more and more important um, over the years. I've seen it grow from really day one of those publishers getting those Twitter accounts. So I'm really excited by all of that as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all three of, of of you and I think it just shows what a kind of depth of experience and knowledge and, and diversity of experience that we've got on the panel as well. And I think there'll be a lot of people watching this, a lot of people attending the conference who are authors, but also perhaps who are wanting to work in this side of the industry as well, who are kind of perhaps wanting to work behind the scenes. And a, a couple of us have said that word campaign, which we sometimes I think think of as electioneering and things like that. Don't we think of it an election campaign? <laughs> but I was wondering if we might think a bit about what we mean when we say a kind of book campaign or a campaign for a certain book. And then beyond that as well, what might make one successful? You know, many of us might just think the book gets written, it gets published, people buy it, and that's the kind of end of the story. But there's this whole idea of the campaign behind a book. Um, and I wonder, Kat, if you wanted to start off with that, just kind of what, what do we mean when we say campaign, but also what, what goes into making a successful one? Yeah, of course, campaign sort of, you know, in potted version, it would be, I suppose, everything that you do on the promotional side, from really the point where you first start talking about the book, so that could be the acquisition announcement, all the way through to, I mean, traditionally to publication, um, and really what I guess we would be talking mostly about is stuff with budget, um, from the marketing point of view, obviously the PR side of that is quite critical too. Um, really in terms of you know I think it can be so varied now and I think authors from an author point of view how they can I guess get stuck into the campaign I mean your publisher if they've got anything good to say should be kind of leading on that campaign and kind of thinking about where does this where does this book sit within the market who's the reader what's the budget when's it out like that's still kind of really I guess top line on on a what a campaign is um I think from the author point of view, what's really exciting now is there's a lot more opportunity for an author to engage with that campaign as well, if they want to, um, especially during this sort of weird time where we're all at home and online, um, author presence can really, I think, 
not make or break a campaign, but it can certainly enhance enhance what the consumer sees. And I think demystifying who the author behind a book is can be quite an exciting element of a campaign. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. That's kind of my potted basics. That's great. Thank you, Kat. And Naomi, I saw you kind of nodding along some of that and you talked in your intro about kind of bespoke things or kind of that, that you've done for certain books as well. Yeah, so I think with with Kat and I in particular, because Hams is in-house, but with Kat and I in particular, we now, as kind of a freelancer and, and for me as an agency, we only contribute a tiny, you know, a tiny part of a campaign. It's part of a much kind of broader um, idea. And um, so, and what I loved about what Kat was just saying is that the opportunities for authors now, it's completely different to when, you know, we were first working. Um, and I find that really thrilling actually this past year you know the past since March the kind of digital innovation that's been happening and the opportunities that have been arising for authors and um, for self-promotion has been really exciting and I've loved seeing kind of authors developing their brand identities on uh, on Instagram because that's the platform I sort of focus on um, and I've got some examples that we can I can uh, mention later on of people that are doing well but I think for me the kind of success of camps that we work on is, is building word of mouth and um, for me word of mouth will always be the most powerful tool for recommendations so how do we replicate that and how do we get people everybody talking about that book um, you know and I think on social that kind of ripple effect can become really clear if you get within the bookstagram community and um, it's that thing of you know have one happy reader and they become a marketing tool in themselves and how do we utilize the community to spread the word uh, on our behalf and um, so for me that's kind of what a successful campaign would look like is you know building a community around around the book. That's really great, Naomi. Thank you. And, and Hamza, Naomi made that point that you're kind of in-house, as it were, so you're within yeah. a, a certain publishing company, so maybe your role is is slightly different in some of these campaigns that you end up working on. Yeah, that's correct. So actually, um, it's a good point that Naomi mentioned that I am in-house, which means I do work with freelancers on the odd occasion, especially if, got, if we've got bigger campaigns to which I can't dedicate my time to, we can outsource that sort of work um, and that might be you know um, the creation of gifts it might be the creation of assets it will be really crisp um, sort of imagery which I think you know is sometimes best to allow someone who specializes in that however what I would reiterate with my role in-house is to make sure that everything from internally uh, of inter from the inside of the publishing house is up to scratch so for example setting up um, you know an advanced reader copy which is sometimes called a proof in the UK and it's called a galley in the United States. And what we do uh, at my publishing house and what my role entails is to ensure that that is uploaded to NetGalley. So when Kat was talking about a campaign from the acquisitions to the announcement, one of the big things we need to do as marketers or you know people who want the book to reach into the hands of an audience, or audiences, um, more on that later. Uh, what I think is really key is for people to be able to read the book in advance. Uh, so that's why we work with NetGalley. We have a, um, a, a page there. So if you look for Icon Books, you'll see some of our lead titles for 2021. Um, and what we do is ensure that we can sort of gauge what readers are going to feel about a particular book and what we would like to do in the lead up to, you know, the book having you know specific social media adverts and one of my uh sort of role one of my my um you know my duties is to set up to sort of say instagram twitter facebook amazon adverts because this is where the market is buying their books and what i do is i lift up the reviews that people have you know talked about especially the positive ones or something that's really unique um and and you know something a bit more i would say uh, than just unputdownable which I see quite a lot and I think you know we ought to steer away from because it just becomes redundant as a word um you know or I love this why did you love this you know why is it that you know Philippa age 50 in you know the Cotswold loved the book on military history <laughs> we need to be you know more creative in our thinking I think as marketers and one of my jobs is to make sure that I you know make sure that everything is moving the cogs are turning and that we have a great campaign which is built on reader reviews but also these 
NetGalley reviewers often post to Goodreads, to Amazon, so various other outlets which can then amplify where the book is reached out. So that's sort of my role uh, as an internal communicator. But as, long, as well as that, you know, I have an overarching, uh, you know, publishing strategy in terms of the marketing, which I head up. I make sure that everything from print uh, publication and slotting an ad for, say, the London Review of Books is created and executed. Uh, one that I recently did was for uh, a football publication called The Square Ball uh, to mark the paperback publication of Leeds, 100 Years of Leeds United, which went into a fan magazine uh, called The Square Ball, to which the author contributes to. So I do a lot of print work, print adverts, uh, but also the online, as I mentioned, um, to name just a few. So, you know, working as an in-house marketer, I have to do um, something that's different to Naomi and Kat, and that is the creation of a catalog. So 2021, we will have a brand new roster of authors, some debut authors, but some seasoned, you know, popular science writers like Brian Clegg at Icon Books. So what I need to do is ensure that we have uh, the catalog created and I have to use various different um, program. So InDesign is a big one. Uh, and that's something that I trained on earlier in my career, and it, which is something I recommend people who would be thinking about moving into the publishing industry to, you know, look at free YouTube tutorials. You don't have to book a rather expensive course. A lot of the resources to train in marketing are available uh, on the internet. Um, but at the same time, once you're working within a company, you do have the opportunity to fine tune those skills and, you know, hone in your craft as a marketer. So that's sort of what I would like to say I do as an internal uh, marketer at a publishing house. Fantastic. I just think it's great to be demystifying these roles or this industry in this way. As I say, I think a lot of us imagine, you know, we write the book, it appears on the shelf and then some, some, we know something else happens, but we're never really <laughs> sure what. And so this kind of demystification of this whole process is great. And I was listening intently to what, to all those answers. And it struck me that, you know, even when I started out, kind of writing maybe sort of 10, 10 years ago, we were told that we should have a website. And then we were told maybe we should have a blog. Maybe we should blog. Everyone should have a blog. And then you'll get a feature film that picks up off of that. And what was really interesting from what we were all saying was I just think the diversity now of platforms. And so Naomi, you mentioned Bookstagram and kind of Bookstagrammers. There's kind of YouTube vloggers. I know that kind of vlog about what they've read. And I just guess kind of what, and there's Twitter, obviously, and probably other ones that I'm too old to know about, but are there kind of, what do these different platforms offer? Are they all offering something different to us in terms of how we might market a book or how we might market ourselves? And kind of what what ways that can they kind of work for us as, as writers or, or as kind of marketers of, of books? Um, Kat, if we come to you first, maybe, or Naomi's nodding. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to touch on this actually because when I started working in in publishing as you said early on it was all you have to build a website you have to have a Twitter you have to and actually I found that the more meetings I had with authors the more you sound like you're being this demanding marketer that's like you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this it's just not realistic for everyone some writers many writers are not comfortable having this kind of public presence and I think that it I just really would love my main advice to publishers and to authors would be do what you can do and do what you're comfortable doing. I do think the spaces are all quite fun once you kind of get to know them. I was saying this in a meeting actually yesterday, I worked with um, Frank Cottrell Boyce, who is just the most incredible writer and um, screenwriter and um, children's book author. And he did not want to have a Twitter for such a long time. And we just were like, we won't push him all good and then one day I think he picked up his phone and downloaded it and and realized how much fun it can be to do it and but I don't believe in publishers putting pressure on on authors to do it unless they genuinely would like to um I do think they all have different qualities they reach different audiences but my personal feeling is that you find the one that works for you and you really like nail that one that's really interesting, Kat. Thank you. And Naomi, so, I mean, your kind of Instagram's your speciality, is that right? Yeah, so when I was at Pan Mac, I did um, the social media training for authors. That was part of my role there. And we covered Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But for me, I just, I, just to echo Kat, 100% agree do one and do it really well don't feel you need to spread yourself thinly across every platform and um, i really don't think that is the the way to do it um i think doing something uh, like instagram having an instagram account that you do really really effectively is is the best way forward um but yeah i think for me 
Instagram just feels now at the moment, and I mean, you know, as we were saying, this changes every decade, the kind of favoured platform. But for me at the moment, Instagram, I think is the most impactful and I've seen the most engagement with it. I think having the kind of visual aspect um, allows a, a kind of different approach to content, whereas Twitter, I think, has very much become a bit of a kind of, yeah, a mouthpiece that can cause, you know, quite polemic people put polemic statements on there it's um it's become more of a kind of argumentative uh, debate platform whereas instagram so i mentioned the bookstagram community earlier and t do tell me if i'm using language um that i need to sort of demystify but bookstagram essentially is a community within instagram it is avid book lovers and book buyers um, all they do is talk about their love of books you rarely see their faces you rarely you you know them through their book recommendations um, and i think that space is so easy for writers and authors to enter into because it, my advice would be get in there and emulate what that you know what the source are already doing you know look at what the bookstagrammers are up to um look at the kind of um book content they're creating uh, and it is you know a simple book stack does incredibly well there's been a, a trend recently which is then now next where people are just posting the book they previously read the book they're reading now and the book they're going to read next and you know, you're engaging with conversations that are already happening. It's very quick, easy content. Um, a couple of authors that I think are doing really amazing, you know, simple stuff on Instagram is Ruth Ware um, and Claire McIntosh. Um, we always, so I do do Instagram training for authors now uh, as part of Tandem. And they are the two that we kind of quite often reference. It's a really good mix of, of the personal and, um, and, profiling their books um, so I think you know Instagram so I'm absolutely rambling now but uh, I think Instagram is a really kind of powerful platform um, to start out with um, and I think as Kat said don't feel the need to be across everything. I think that's just, really great think, and hands it like oh sorry Kat go on. I only just wanted to say this really short thing which is if you're not sure your publisher is there to help you yeah. so do ask them yeah. and ask them for advice. I think that's a re that's a really good point, actually. Never be afraid to kind of speak out. And Hamza, kind of from that publisher's point of view, I guess are there certain books that you think this will work better on this platform, or this? I know that this book needs to be marketed to a certain generation, so this kind of platform works better. Or are you kind of working across that spread of of the different um, social meds, as I believe they're called in the business? <laughs> um, that's a really good question, actually. When it comes to various sort of audiences, we have, and I'm sure very many other publishers have, what's called segmentation. Um, so we like to compartmentalise the ideal audience. So if it's, a, say, a military history book on World War II and Hitler's South African Spies, which is the book that is coming up next year uh, from us as part of um, the new uh, Jonathan Ball publishers that we're incorporating as part of Icon Books. Um, but I think what we need to do is, you know, look at who we think is going to buy the book. If a book is priced at $16.99, we need to look at the breakdown of the people buying the book. So we use, um, you know, the social, these sort of abbreviations which pertain to different social uh, economic backgrounds to the people buying it. So one of them uh, is often ABC1, which is pretty much professionals with a high, you know, living in high affluent areas who have disposable income, etc. So I think, you know, we have to think about the audience as the, the main audience who we think will buy this, but actually we also find that, you know, as part of my role, we have to look at various different audiences, a strand. So we have people who can buy books as a gift for said, you know, father or mother interested in history. Uh, but I think, you know, when it comes to social media and, and, and engaging with various, various audiences, I would say tick, uh, TikTok is one of the latest ones, which I'm sure you've all heard about and have practiced a dance or three. If not, um, you should try out because it is just hilarious. But that again, you know, can, can vary. So right now we've got TikTok, which is, you know, one of the most fastest growing platforms for teenagers, people, you know, who have, you know, I would say not even that, that kind of, you know, generation Z, I'd call them, and um, people born after 1999. Um, but you have, you know, what's called millennials. Um, so people from the back of the 80s to, to the 
um, sort of naive. But I think, you know, for example, Facebook is something which people in their sort of, you know, 50s, 60s are still using. I mean, people have just managed to, to, to latch onto that. And I think for them, they won't ever move to TikTok or it's very rare to have an older person engage with TikTok. So you've got to think about the strands of publishing and the segmentation, as I mentioned a minute ago, and how we as publishers have a duty to not just reach one audience, but to look at various different strands of audiences. I think the best publishing is the one which reaches people in different um, you know, age brackets, different interests, but also can make the books relatable. Um, you know, a lot of people are using you know, Twitter and Facebook who are in sort of old demographic regions, but then you've got the newer Snapchat and the TikToks of the world, which will, you know, really uh, bring the books into the eyes of little teenagers or, or younger audiences. And that, in my past, um, you know, experience working with, say, YouTube influencers and people who have uh, that audience can be, you know, profile. Um, but, you know, I think you have to be really um, careful when, you know, thinking about the audience buying the book, but also um, you know, just be quite innovative in your approach and not just to be complacent on, you know, banking on one audience because you've had a success with one book because, you know, the more dynamic we are in our approaches, the better chances we are of having that book reach the various strands and having, you know, a successful campaign because if we go back to that word campaign and Kat and Naomi mentioned it wonderfully, um, we have to think about the book as a publishing house, not just up until publication date, but we want it to to continue to be out there in the world for years and years after it's published. So once it is published or, you know, a year after, it'll be what we call a backlist title. Um, so it'll go from its first iteration in a hardcover, typically, and then it'll move into its paperback iteration. So we have to think, you know, as marketers, what can we do to, you know, say in that first iteration, um, how did we reach an audience and how successful still was it? Whereas I think when you bring the price point down for, uh, the paperback edition, which is always the case normally, um, you know, how will we reach a, a more kind of mass market audience? Um, and that's when you're looking at, you know, the say the supermarkets and, and, and various other, you know, retailers which can allow for the book to be bought. So, you know, back to your question and just to finish because I feel like I am rambling, but, you know, I think it's so important to think about audiences carefully to, to you know, not just have, a, um, you know, a one-dimensional, uh, approach to, to marketing your books. I think the best marketers and the best marketers in the industry are those that, you know, consider different markets and go down various strands quite effectively and across different platforms. Again, if that's the right approach for that book. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, these are such insightful answers. Even I think thinking about these things of different audiences, different socioeconomic backgrounds of audiences, kind of price points of books and things like that. It's stuff we rarely get to hear about, but it is vital, I think, to equip us um, in order to enter this world. And I was thinking about, you know, we thought a bit about from, <clears throat> I guess, that behind the scenes industry point of view and just kind of, if I might do a bit of role playing, I'm a new author. I'm kind of working on my first book. It might be coming out at some point, but maybe I've just come out of a MA program or I'm just, you know, I'm working a job, but I'm writing this novel or this poetry collection in the evenings, but I'm wanting to begin to build a presence for myself as I think the book's coming out. What, but I'm a bit of a Luddite and I'm, I'm not kind of au fait with various kind of, you know, I'm not on TikTok and things like that. But what are some really simple things that you think that new writers um, or emerging writers might be able to do that that could really work for them in terms of this online presence or in terms of this branding of themselves? What are some kind of easy things or quick things that they might be able to do? Um, Hamza, if we come to you first, just because you're still on my screen from the last question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I would say one of my fiction highlights of this year has been... Um, her, what's it called? Jean Patrol on the Purple Line by Deepa Anapara. Um, and Deepa does not have a presence on Twitter. Now she um, did a creative writing course. She's won various prizes. And I think she's hit the nail on the head. And I think if anyone wants to follow her trajectory as a new writer and someone who is, you know, someone who's, you know, who's completed most recently a master's or creative writing course, um, she uses Instagram. So she shares, you know, her art. I mean, this is, Again, when the book has been published, I should mention. Um, but, you know, if you are uh, someone who's engaged with Instagram now, I think that's the most kind of, I would say, easily, you know, it, it's the platform where I think people are most 
easily impressed and it takes the least effort because whereas with Twitter, I think you have 280 characters and you have to think of, oh, I've got to be funny. Oh, I've got to be cool. I've got to do this. But I think as long as you're authentic and, you know, your voice is how you want the world to see you as an author, you in your process of writing, you in your life and how you're going about that life, how you're, you know, formulating characters. This is, again, something which will absolutely captivate your potential audience, your potential readers. They want to know what you're doing and how you find inspiration and how you see the world and how your mind works. And I think Instagram is probably my go-to <clears throat> platform for a brand new um, author who's, you know, in that scenario, uh, maybe not okay with Twitter or with Facebook or has them, but for personal, you know, usage and not for their author profile. And I think you know, when you're an author, you have to sort of disassociate yourself, um, you know, as a friend, as a family member, and actually think about you as an author. If you have that in the centre of your profile as a writer, so it might be Andrew McMillan, poet, and you set that up and you write posts on Instagram. And I think that's the most creative way because you're writing with words or you're putting words on a piece of paper, whereas I think Instagram allows you to have you know, images and collages and the grid, you know, the, you know, the three by three grid we talk about in marketing. So that's three boxes by three down. You can cut up images, you can work Instagram to your advantage and allow yourself to be, you know, creative in ways that your writing um, might not. And it's a different way of, of, of you, know, you know, not branding yourself because you're not doing that. You're putting yourself out there because you're ready to share your words with, an audience so I think that's important and I think for me Instagram is that go-to application. That's really interesting and Naomi obviously kind of your you, you were talking to us about Instagram a little bit earlier and I was interested when Hamza was saying then about that th there's a tension isn't there or there's a struggle between that sense of I want to disassociate from my friends and family and I, and I need the or the author sells so it's not just me holding a glass of wine in a pub kind of every time I take a picture but then again we want to see the kind of person behind the book, don't we? And we kind of want to see that um, that personality, I guess. And mm -hmm. is, in, in the authors that you work with, is that sometimes one of the wrestles that they have? Um, I mean, on Instagram, no. I think that potentially is when you're first approaching it, yes, you, you don't know how much to share. But I think the authors that I mentioned earlier, and also um, an author called Marianne Power, she's very personal on hers, and but that's part of her brand. And I think it's working out how much you want to share, but absolutely people want to see behind the scenes um, and Hamza was saying you know they want to see your inspiration they want to see into your you know how your mind works people want to see the writing process you know to show them what your writing process looks like show them where you sit to write um, show them what your you know uh, what your kind of first drafts look like um, people want to see that it's all content that you have to hand um, you don't need to you know Hamza used the word authentic earlier and you know it does just need to be authentically you it doesn't actually need to be slick and sparkly um, stories uh, Instagram stories allow you to sort of just show stuff from your day that doesn't have to be beautifully photographed you know grid posts slightly different you can take more time uh, you know post twice a week it doesn't have to be an everyday thing um, and I think just to kind of go back to the question of you know you're starting out you're a bit nervous you haven't used social before there are so many amazing cheap courses out there so when I you know I, I never had any interest in social media I don't know how I've fallen into it and now I love it you know I think Instagram I, I you know I live it every day I'm that's how my whole business functions um, but in the beginning I knew nothing um, so I signed up to a platform called Udemy it's a kind of global training um, online platform um, and you can get an Instagram course for $9.99 you know a client I shouldn't admit this but a client said to me when I first went freelance do you know how to do um you know Instagram training I said yeah um did a 999 course on Udemy um and you know have learned from that point on um so there's a lot of kind of and another actually good tip is later is a scheduling platform um for Instagram um 
and that's something that you know that's kind of down the line how to save time by scheduling your own content in but later have amazing resources to hand so if you look on their blog they're often talking about kind of the new functions that instagram's introducing um, they have lots of content ideas and um, they have case studies um, and also following their own um following their Instagram as well. Uh, you can kind of garner all these amazing insights and advice um, from, from, yeah, from all sorts of places. Um, so I think just doing your, you know, not being, just treading slowly and carefully, not rushing in there thinking you have to be an amazing photographer, um, reading up on what would work for you. And just to go back to a point I made earlier, getting in the Bookstagram community, um, seeing what they're doing, uh, engaging with their content, having conversations and chats. It's the friendliest social media platform I have ever encountered. Um, you know, and I think just talking, talking to people um, and seeing what, what people engage with, um, that would be my kind of, yeah, first step for someone that's a bit nervous. Thank you so much for that, Naomi. And Kat, I guess, you know, the same question to you, but also some of these big brands that you talk about working with, so things like World Book Day, are they sort of coming to you with, you know, they've got kind of stakeholders and they've got a certain, you know, kind of um, brand for the World Book Day events that they want to do? And is part of your job thinking how, how best can we communicate that through things like Instagram or Twitter? Like what's, how best do we reach audiences in a non-corporate way, I guess? Yeah, I mean, World Book Day is really interesting because um, World Book Day is really exciting for me to work on because it's a brand that is known by name globally. Like Everyone knows what World Book Day is. Everyone's got a kind of, you know, something that clicks into their mind when you say World Book Day. The World Book Day social media, the World Book Day team, I should say, is quite small. Like you would think it was a lot bigger than it was. The social media element of it. So from my role was like doing their I guess their campaign consultancy my focus would be more on kind of I guess how we use their social media around campaign touch points um a lot of the the world book day thing is really interesting and actually probably could be applied to authors because a lot of what we want to do is share content that helps um helps the consumer and the reader engage with our purpose and you know the purpose for world book day is to bring more children to reading um and to help children find their first book so we ultimately look at our wonderful one pound authors um and use quotes from them use content from them and work and we're actually trying to work out how to use video this year to really kind of talk more broadly about but simply about the themes that we want people to engage with. So World Book Day is quite a big scope um, and it's absolutely part of my job to try and help them to, to capture an audience online. Um, going back to the kind of, I'm a new author, um, what can I do thing? I, I just want to put a bit of a wider lens on it, um, which I think, I, I read some really interesting advice for authors about finding an agent. And they and it said, look in the acknowledgements of your favorite books and find out who that agent is. And so I would actually apply that to social. If you love, if you think, right, I want to be the next Tomi Adeyemi or Francis Harding or Lee Bardugo or whoever, go and look at what they do. And, you know, what platforms are they on? Because I think, you know, these guys have sung the praises of Instagram really well. But I actually think for if you're a picture book author, Facebook is where you want to be because that's where all the mums are. If you're on the middle grade community in YA, actually there is a home for Twitter. Twitter is quite a dangerous space at the moment. I think it's quite aggressive because we've all got so much time on our hands and we're all very cross about a lot of things, quite rightly so. Um, but you know, Twitter's a really wonderful place to connect with booksellers, um, which we haven't talked about really much here, um, who are also really big champions for your novel so I that's my kind of wider lens for you is actually have a little look at I guess what you aspire to and try and see if you think right well you know as I say Tomi's got Instagram I'm gonna get an Instagram I'm gonna see what she does I'm gonna learn from the people that have already experimented a little bit and I that would be kind of my advice um brands have it a little bit easier I think because um you've got that kind of background of familiarity to you to kind of play on I really like that idea Kat, of kind of going to the back of the book, like you say, and finding who the agent is, but then yeah. thinking, well, how, how are these authors marketing themselves and, and trying to put yourself in that conversation or kind of putting yourself in that kind of lineage of those authors? I think that's such good advice. I think that's really interesting. I can't and, remember whose um, advice it was. I wish I could credit them, but it's 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 not my personal. I've, I found, I read it somewhere and I was like, that's pretend it was. Yeah. We can just say you yeah, claim it's yours. Yeah. yeah. All me. Claim it. <laughs> 
Um, and again, for everyone watching, in about sort of five minutes, we're going to open up um, and have questions from from all of you um, who are watching um, for the panel. But I just wonder, you know, I, I worked in fact with Naomi earlier this year on, um, in fact last month or really this month's time is elastic at the minute, on an event that should have been live. It was a kind of poetry prize giving and um, Naomi did a brilliant job kind of behind the scenes of coordinating poets to kind of come on and off screen on kind of Zoom prize giving for something. Um, and Kat, I know you mentioned in the introduction kind of what this kind of new world that we've all been thrust into has kind of opened up in terms of possibilities for, I think not only for accessibility, um, but also for, for, for us to try new things and new ways of trying to reach audiences. I think, you know, particularly for small presses and for, for new authors, one of the main ways that they meet people and sell books is by doing live events, isn't it? So they do a live event in a bookshop, they do a lit fest, they sell books. That's kind of been taken away from us. And I just wonder, I'm not asking us to predict the future because I think that's impossible, but just in terms of this kind of online content and branding oneself and the kind of online presence, what has shifted and what's changed and what might become permanent now? What's now possible that we maybe haven't thought of before March? before we were kind of thrust into this world. Um, Naomi, I can see you nodding and then we'll kind of just move down the line maybe. Well, I think it's actually just going back to kind of the point about the Zoom event that we did together, Andrew. So we did um, a, a huge event last week for Quirkus. It was their word of mouth bestsellers event. And we had 500 people come to it. You know, events that are in, you know, last year I was very much running live events. Um, and, you know, the, the most you could get were 100, 100 people to attend. And this really excites me in that now events that we do online can have a global audience, which we couldn't have done before. Uh, we had authors zooming in from all over the world for the, the event last week. Um, and being able to have that many people attend is so exciting. Um, and I think that is going to continue, to be honest. I think we've all become very accustomed to these kind of events. Um, and I think because it, it the scale of them is so much greater online, um, I think there's hopefully, I mean, Zoom is still quite an imperfect platform. There's lots of kind of niggles with it. Um, there's lots of kind of back end stuff that isn't perfect. So I think we're going to see some really slick event platforms emerging um, that we'll be able to harness and, and use so that, you know, that we're working on a lot of um, like uh, in sync global campaigns now. So when we're working on a UK publication, we're also working on the Australian publication and we're able to bring these audiences together. So quite often on Instagram, we have closed um, direct messaging groups and we have people from all over the world in them discussing so not only do you have the ability to be working on that global scale you can also get, connect global audiences um, so that for me is really really exciting and I hope you know long may that continue um, but yeah maybe over to, to Hamza or Kat. Yeah Kat yeah. I mean does that kind of <laughs> ring true for you in terms of you know, the new possibilities that this has opened up. I mean, you had that big career change in May, so you're kind of, you've been living through that that shift as well. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, you know, one of the things I, I, Naomi's absolutely right and sort of took the words out of my mouth, but the other thing I think that has been really interesting for me is how much more creative we've all had to be. And I actually think what's really revealing is that what haven't we missed you know everyone thinks that when they launch their book they want to have a launch party in a basement of a bookshop with warm white wine and you know maybe one journalist from the ft will turn up and they'll call that a success but actually i went to a zoom launch event that was half an hour long oh it's just wonderful i was like logged on at half five had my own little cold, perfectly cold glass of wine you know and it was really i just think in and that and things like you know i think a lot of authors dream about having outdoor advertising you know on a, at a train station and a lot of that is often one of the questions you get is always oh, is my book gonna have well actually now it doesn't mean anything no one's getting trains or shouldn't be um so I think it's really made us have to think what can we do how can we do it for me something that's very exciting about children and families um and I actually said in a meeting the other day oh, the great thing about coronavirus and then felt absolutely awful for saying it but 
you know, families are engaging with their children in, in really different ways. And, are you know, if you look at things like the CBB celebrity teacher, supply teacher, um, that was a mate, David Attenborough teaching children about history or, you know, geography, those things would not be happening and we would not be thinking in this kind of really movable way. How can we, you know, for me, it's like, how can I reach those children at home? How can I make sure that they are getting this engagement that we we took for granted before we would just do this, this and this. So I think creativity is really, is, is probably the sad, un, ungrateful winner of coronavirus, but it's, we're all thinking differently, I think now, which is exciting for me in a new role, I would say as well. I think that's really interesting. And, and Hamza, is that something that you feel from within that publisher that you, you've kind of had to shift your kind yeah. of focus or, or how you're reaching these audiences? Yeah, no, I would say definitely. So, I mean, we had an online launch for um, a book about radium uh, called Half Lives, and it was wonderful because all it was was a half an hour event and you just log on. And like Kat said, you don't have warm wine and, you know, you don't have to faff about. You can be in your pyjamas for all you care. You know, you could be sat on a sofa, a couch with your feet up and a glass of cold ice lemonade in my case. But I think it's so important to know that you know, the, the new normal is quite an exciting time to think about how we can work creatively. And I think Kat nails it on the head. She said, it's wonderful how, you know, we've all had to, you know, it, it's sort of like shifting gears. It's almost having to think outside of the box, which I think we should always be doing. Um, and I think we have to host events now in a different way. And, you know, maybe they don't have to be, you know, an hour, two hour. They can just be very succinct, 30 minute, zoom um events which can celebrate and you can raise a glass you can raise you know you can you can absolutely you know celebrate with that author by sending them a home delivery of you know their favorite flowers or whatever it is um you know but we don't have to confine ourselves to you know having that level of um you know just i would say sometimes you know events can can, can really drag on and i think whereas with this it feels very focused it feels very energized and i think it just means that, that that's one more thing to sort of tick off. But also from the author or the writer's perspective, I think, you know, you're grateful and we have an absolute joy working with authors. And I think, you know, we also, you know, again, having worked like a nine to five to actually then do, you know, two to three hours extra, you know, it is quite tiring um, to have to, to, to be fully switched on. Um, so I think in terms of um, allowing people to thrive, um, you know, in terms of, having done a day's work for them to celebrate. I think these little sort of snippets of, of online Zoom launches are something to be commended. I think they're great. Um, but another thing I wanted to add, which isn't relating to, to writers, but it's actually from a, a publisher's uh, internal perspective, is that last week I attended the Independent Publishers Guild virtual conference online. Now, normally we would only be able to, being a small publisher, send you know one or two of our members of staff but actually we could send everybody should they want to go because the cost of the ticket isn't as much, uh, you know, which can be sometimes, uh, you know, a, a very high expense for a publishing house, especially an independent publisher like Icon. Um, so I think it's important to uh, just uh, celebrate the wins of, you know, having this sort of fantastic virtual conference where you can choose what you want to go to, but also it's all recorded. And, you know, if you're in the foyer having a chat with say Kat who you worked at, at Pan Mac three years ago and you're missing the start of a new conference you don't need to worry about that you can catch up at your own pace you can do whatever you like you know you can bring your own snacks and most of all you can sit in your pajamas and watch the conference and um, great speakers like Sam Missingham uh, whose talk I really enjoyed and I also went to a talk about Stonewall and um, inclusivity uh, about LGBTQ as well so I think it's absolutely fantastic that we're all engaging with the online mediums I think at the very start of lockdown we did all go a bit Zoom heavy and got what we all call Zoom fatigue. But right now, I think we've managed to find a balance or a happy medium with Zoom. And it's not the doom and gloom of this new normal we're all living through. I think we can work with Teams, Zoom, whatever you fancy using, uh, go for it. But I think, you know, especially for the next six to 18 months, we're going to find ourselves um, doing things online. Um, and it's about, you know, taking care of yourself and your authors. Um, when presented with these opportunities to hopefully allow them to shout out about their books and share them with all these wonderful readers in the world. Fantastic. Thank you so much for those answers. And, you know, I just think this has been a great example of how great an event can be. 
um, via Zoom and with all these kind of fantastic and important answers that we've got. I'm going to hand back over to Comma Press now. We're going to field questions from our live okay. studio audience. <laughs> we've got so many questions and I'm going to combine a few uh, that might be best for you Andrew to answer because um, Betty got... was asking <laughs> or anyone who's worked on poetry campaigns so Betty was asking <clears throat> if anyone has any tips for a poetry campaign um, and then someone asked you Andrew directly uh, what you've done yourself uh, on social media to grow your own readership and community um, so those are two really interesting questions. I mean, poetry is an interesting one because marketing campaigns and the professionals can jump in and correct me. They're kind of, if we're thinking about kind of market share and market audiences, poetry's market share has grown a lot, but it's still a kind of very small part of the kind of wider publishing pie to a certain extent. Poetry has a very interesting audience in that it has a very dedicated audience but it's quite a niche one. And so what po very few poetry collections, some occasionally do, uh, Rachel Long's My Darling from the Lions, I think would be a, an example from this year, kind of speak back out towards a wider audience, but poetry tends to be um, a kind of fairly small circle of, of people who who are kind of obsessed by it. And so know all the books that are coming out have kind of read them and things like that. Um, but I think in terms of poetry campaigns, it tends to be, um, you know, through through physical kind of readings or through online readings and through just kind of delivering the work to an audience, either kind of through poetry films or through recordings of readings and things like that. It's about kind of, with poetry, I think certainly giving them, giving an audience something that they wouldn't get just from the book. Um, and so that tends to be kind of having it out really and so kind of having it out loud. Um, from my own social media point of view, I've just done it very badly. My Instagram has one picture every two months of me tending to hold a glass of wine in the same pose in a different restaurant. Um, so that's not really a brand. My Twitter is the space that I use more. Um, and I think Twitter, just as was said earlier, is a great space to connect with booksellers and to connect with publishers actually. And I use Twitter almost like a shop window. Just to, I get sent a lot of proofs and a lot of books and just to say, oh, I've been sent this, this is interesting. Um, and then to, kind of say oh, I've got a new poem coming out somewhere just as a kind of shop window both to myself and other people. I mean, I don't know, um, the, the professionals might be able to comment. What I've never found is I've got about 15,000 followers on Twitter, but I don't sell 15,000 copies of my books and 15,000 people don't come to the events. And so I think it's often harder to, there's a thing of crossover, isn't there, between kind of engagement with people and, and kind of how, how to do that, I guess, um, is something that I've not really cracked, but I probably need a course in order to learn. Go on, I mean, I, I've worked on a, a few poetry anthologies in my time. Um, I've worked on Ali Aziri and Chris Riddell, and I would say very loosely one thing I'd say that's brilliant about poetry is that you've got um and we haven't talked a lot about audience today but you've got a community of really engaged um readers that will love poetry and I think they I think one of the challenges I love about marketing is how you identify your audience how you find your tribe and you use that to your maximum advantage I think poetry is a really nice example of that because the people who love poetry love poetry um in terms of the kind of conversion thing it's a it's a bit of a slow burn I think it's a bit of a kind of Twitter's the great example for that I think it's about how you kind of find you mine your content that you have poetry is great because it's so shareable you know there's some incredible I've, I can't think of the author that's terrible but um there's an incredible author that just shares poetry on the reg and, and gets so many retweets because it's so kind of and I think what you know kind of concise words is very shareable on both Instagram and Twitter now but yeah I think it's a bit of a slow burn on the conversion rate you kind of have to keep being in up in their you know their feed and then eventually you know and don't be afraid to just say I've got an event did I did I mention I've got an event <laughs> the event mm -hmm. is tomorrow come to it be my oh I just muted myself that would be my um my small tiny bit of insight there Amazing. Um, I'm going to go on to the second question. Um, Hamza, this might be one for you. Uh, someone's asking how important is online presence before submitting work to agents and publishers? So do you, is that something that you look at before you kind of take on a manuscript, would you say? Oh, in interesting, actually, depends what sort of work it is. Um, so I co-commissioned um, Shabana Galati's memoir, Remember Me, 
Uh, and that's obviously, you know, she's someone who's had this amazing television career, having been in Dinner Ladies and, and Coronation Street. Um, but she was actually someone who shared her blog post on Alzheimer's Research UK. And that was what, it, you know, allowed me to think, OK, that is something that should be a book. I think we need to get this published. Mm. So at the time I was working at Octopus Books, part of Hachette, and I brought it to the table. I worked with the editor to basically acquire the book. So I think, you know, sharing your content. So this is, again, pertaining to nonfiction. I can't speak uh, on behalf of fiction, um, but I would say absolutely share everything that you're doing, any sort of articles that you're writing, post them on your Twitter, on your Instagram. Um, you know, if you do have um, a knack or a creative flair, you know, do pull out lovely, you know, quotes from that article, um, curate, you know, that long read into an Instagram story, perhaps even an, a highlight. The more creative you are with your platform, uh, the more kind of, you know, appealing it is for publishers to pick up your book. They're going to think, wow, you know, this person has this creative vision and they're able to curate their work um, to beyond it being, you know, words on a piece of paper or a manuscript. So I would say, um, you know, really shout out about your work, um, you know, be it a blog post, be it, you know, a feature in a magazine, or if there's something, you know, that would help you in your uh, journey to being published um, or would help you or sharpen the tools in the bag. I think if a publisher sees that you've got a great online uh, presence or that you've got an already engaged audience, uh, it might not, it doesn't have to be, uh, in the hundreds of thousands as well. And I, I really want to emphasize this. Do not be fooled by having hundreds of thousands and never ever, you know, think about buying followers because, um, you know, your engagement is more important. So if you have a thousand followers and each of them like your post and engage with it in some way, as opposed to having hundred thousand on, on only, you know, three like it, you know, that that's quite telling. Um, but again, you know, publishers aren't, you know, you know, finding people on Instagram accounts as well, I should reiterate, you know, there's a whole sort of overarching uh, package and a lot of research that goes on. A lot of, uh, you know, publishers um, have to think about, you know, a project, about the audience. There's so many multi, uh, there are so many factors that come into play when, you know, publishing. Um, and this is, again, with regards to nonfiction. And of course, there's a traditional route uh, to having an agent as well, uh, which I think a lot of people might have or might be thinking about which I also recommend but again part of that working with your agent will be you know making sure that you can bolster your profile online that you can make sure that you're getting yourself in front of the right kind of you know um, publications or even if you've had a feature how to really um, amplify uh, your voice and and why you are the right person to write that book as well so think about your intention as well I would say um, if you're writing a book that is you know probably quite far removed from your culture, think about your purpose. Are you the person to be writing that book? And question mark, you know, think about those things carefully. There's a lot of nuance to be had. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you really feel strongly about something, then go with it. Um, but I do think that there's um, a conversation to be had about how uh, to promote yourself uh, when you've not got a book deal or an agent and you're just at the very early stages and it can be done, it can be done very well. So I hope that answers your question. Amazing, thank you. Um, so Anise was asking, and I'm going to throw this at Kat and Naomi. I think you guys might have some thoughts on this. Um, what is the absolute like thing that people shouldn't be writers shouldn't be uh, posting on their social media accounts? Do you think? Um, shall I jump in first, Kat? So uh, I think Kat and I probably will say the same thing, but don't over promote yourself. I mean, there needs to be humility there, like be humble. Um, no one just wants to have the hard sell. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier about sort of sharing, you know, more kind of personal behind the scenes content. Um, people want to know who you are beyond being an author. Um, so don't over promote. Um, I'm, I wouldn't follow an account that was just constant hard sell um, and the second thing is be careful about you know political views and talking about anything that could cause kind of friction or um, obviously do support campaigns that you feel very strongly about but just be prepared for kind of uh, how you how you will respond uh, if there's backlash um, so just being sort of sensitive to what you're you're sharing um, yeah, that would be my sort of top, top two. 
That was mine too about kind of how you manage that conversation, um, any kind of conflict online. I, I really, it's really complicated, I think, especially at the moment because <laughs> nobody wants to be censoring anyone. There are a lot of strong views flying around at the moment, especially in publishing actually, which is something I've found really interesting. Um, but I think being mindful of of what, yeah, of like just I guess like Naomi saying like what the consequence or the fallout of that could be or the response. Um, and the other thing I would just say is, and this is a real personal one for me is like, I, I would advise against kind of negative reviews of other authors, um, but just because I feel like it's kind of mean. And I, I, I think we all know how hard it is to get to that space. So I, I, I don't see it personally, but that would be one thing I would say, like support your industry and your, and your fellow author friends and kind of use it as a kind of nice way to, you know, I had a really nice meeting with a debut author yesterday and she was like, I'm just using my Twitter to like promote other people in the middle grade world. And I was like, yes, more yeah. of that and, and less kind of negativity, I suppose. I, I, I doubt many people are sitting there going, oh, I hate this book, but I, it sits really weirdly with me when we all work in this industry and we know how hard it is. So that would be advice I would yeah. give. Absolutely. Um, I think we're just about out of time. So thank you to all the questions. I'm sorry to anyone who didn't get that didn't get answered um, today. But I want to say a huge thank you to all my panelists. So Hamza, to Kat, to Andrew for chairing so brilliantly and to Naomi uh, for being with us at the conference today. Um, we have two more free panel events uh, tomorrow morning at 11 and Friday morning at 11, um, which are focused on meeting the literary agents. So getting some background onto how they work. Um, and the fourth one is with a group of writers talking about where they find their inspirations and how they apply it to their work. Um, so if you want to tune into those, but thank you so much guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think it's been really helpful. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks guys. You're welcome. Bye for now. Bye.